The Walrus and the Carpenter by Lewis Carroll Read by Taylor Seth Hall The sun was shining on the sea, shining with all his might. He did his very best to make the billows smooth and bright. And this was odd, because it was the middle of the night. The moon was shining sulkily, because she thought the sun had got no business to be there after the day was done. It's very rude of him, she said, to come and spoil the fun. The sea was wet as wet could be, the sands were dry as dry. You could not see a cloud, because no cloud was in the sky. No birds were flying overhead, there were no birds to fly. The walrus and the carpenter were walking close at hand. They wept like anything to see such quantities of sand. If this were only cleared away, they said, it would be grand. If seven maids with seven mops swept it for half a year, do you suppose, the walrus said, that they could get it clear? I doubt it, said the carpenter, and shed a bitter tear. Oh, oysters, come and walk with us, the walrus did beseech. A pleasant walk, a pleasant talk, along the briny beach. We cannot do with more than four to give a hand to each. The eldest oyster looked at him, but never a word he said. The eldest oyster winked his eye and shook his heavy head, meaning to say he did not choose to leave the oyster bed. But four young oysters hurried up, all eager for the treat. Their coats were brushed, their faces washed, their shoes were clean and neat. And this was odd, because, you know, they hadn't any feet. Four other oysters followed them, and yet another four. And thick and fast they came at last, and more and more and more, all hopping through the frothy waves and scrambling to the shore. The walrus and the carpenter walked on a mile or so, and then they rested on a rock conveniently low, and all the little oysters stood and waited in a row. The time has come, the walrus said, to talk of many things, of shoes and ships and sealing wax, of cabbages and kings, and why the sea is boiling hot, and whether pigs have wings. But wait a bit, the oysters cried, before we have our chat, for some of us are out of breath, and all of us are fat. No hurry, said the carpenter. They thanked him much for that. A loaf of bread, the walrus said, is what we chiefly need. Pepper and vinegar besides are very good indeed. Now if you are ready, oysters, dear, we can begin to feed. But not on us, the oysters cried, turning a little blue. After such kindness, that would be a dismal thing to do. The night is fine, the walrus said. Do you admire the view? It was so kind of you to come, and you are very nice. The carpenter said nothing but, cut us another slice. I wish you were not quite so deaf, I've had to ask you twice. It seems a shame, the walrus said, to play them such a trick, after we've brought them out so far and made them trot so quick. The carpenter said nothing but, the butter's spread too thick. I weep for you, the walrus said, I deeply sympathize. With sobs and tears he sorted out those of the largest size, holding his pocket handkerchief before his streaming eyes. Oh, oysters, said the carpenter, you've had a pleasant run. Shall we be trotting home again? But answer there came none. And this was scarcely odd because they'd eaten every one. The Little Red Hen by Florence White Williams Narrated by Taylor Seth Hall A little red hen lived in a barnyard. She spent almost all of her time walking about the barnyard in her pickety-peckety fashion, scratching everywhere for worms. She dearly loved fat, delicious worms and felt they were absolutely necessary to the health of her children. As often as she found a worm, she would call, Chuck! 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 to her chickies. When they were gathered about her, she would distribute choice morsels of her tidbit. A busy little body was she. A cat usually napped lazily in the barn door, not even bothering herself to scare the rat 
who ran here and there as he pleased. And as for the pig who lived in the sty, he did not care what happened so long as he could eat and grow fat. One day the little red hen found a seed. It was a wheat seed, but the little red hen was so accustomed to bugs and worms that she supposed this to be some new and perhaps very delicious kind of meat. She bit it gently, and found that it resembled a worm in no way whatsoever as to taste, although because it was long and slender a little red hen might easily be fooled by its appearance. Carrying it about, she made many inquiries as to what it might be, she found that it was a wheat seed, and that, if planted, it would grow up, and when ripe, it could be made into flour, and then into bread. When she discovered that, she knew it ought to be planted. She was so busy hunting for herself and for her family, that naturally she thought she ought not to take time to plant it. So she thought of the pig, upon whom time must hang heavily, and of the cat who had nothing to do, and of the great fat rat with his idle hours, and she called loudly, Who will plant the seed? But the pig said, Not I. And the cat said, Not I. And the rat said, Not I. Well then, said the little red hen, I will. And she did. Then she went on with her daily duties through the long summer days, scratching for worms and feeding her chicks, while the pig grew fat, and the cat grew fat, and the rat grew fat, and the wheat grew tall and ready for harvest. So one day the little red hen chanced to notice how large the wheat was, and that the grain was ripe. So she ran about calling briskly, Who will cut? The wheat! The pig said, Not I! The cat said, Not I! And the rat said, Not I! Well then, said the little red hen, I will! And she did. She got the sickle from among the farmer's tools in the barn and proceeded to cut off all the big plant of wheat. On the ground lay the nicely cut wheat, ready to be gathered and threshed. But the newest and yellowest and downiest of Mrs. Hen's chicks set up a peep, peep, peeping in their most vigorous fashion, proclaiming to the world at large, but most particularly to their mother, that she was neglecting them. Poor little red hen! She felt quite bewildered and hardly knew where to turn. Her attention was sorely divided between her duty to her children and her duty to the wheat, for which she felt responsible. So again, in a very hopeful tone, she called out, Who will thresh the wheat? But the pig, with a grunt, said, Not I. And the cat, with a meow, said, Meow, not I. And the rat, with a squeak, said, Me, not I. So the little red hen, looking, it must be admitted, rather discouraged, said, Well, I will, then. And she did. Of course, she had to feed her babies first, though, and when she had gotten them all to sleep for their afternoon nap, she went out and threshed the wheat. Then she called out, Who will carry the wheat to the mill to be ground? Turning their backs with snippy glee, that pig said, Not I. And that cat said, Not I. And that rat said, Not I. So the good little red hen could do nothing but say, I will then. And she did. Carrying the sack of wheat, she trudged off to the distant mill. There she ordered the wheat ground into beautiful white flour. When the miller brought her the flour, she walked slowly back, all the way to her own barnyard in her own pickety peckety fashion. She even managed, in spite of her load, to catch a nice juicy worm now and then, and had one left for the babies when she reached them. Those cunning little fluff balls were so glad to see their mother. For the first time, they really appreciated her. After this really strenuous day, Mrs. Hen retired to her slumbers earlier than usual, indeed before the colors came into the sky, to herald the setting of the sun, her usual bedtime hour. 
She would have liked to sleep late in the morning, but her chicks, joining in the morning chorus of the henyard, drove away all hopes of such a luxury. Even as she sleepily half-opened one eye, the thought came to her that today that wheat must somehow be made into bread. She was not in the habit of making bread, of course, anyone can make it if he or she follows the recipe with care, and she knew perfectly well that she could do it if necessary. So after her children were fed and made sweet and fresh for the day, she hunted up the pig, the cat, and the rat. Still confident that they would surely help her some day, she sang out, Who will make the bread? Alas for the little red hen. Once more her hopes were dashed, for the pig said, Not I, the cat said, Not I, and the rat said, <coughs> Not I. So the little red hen said once more, I will then, and she did, Feeling that she might have known all the time that she would have to do it all herself, she went and put on a fresh apron and spotless cook's cap. First of all, she set the dough, as was proper. When it was time, she brought out the molding board and the baking tins, molded the bread, divided it into loaves, and put them into the oven to bake. All the while the cat sat lazily by, giggling and chuckling, and close at hand the vain rat powdered his nose and admired himself in the mirror. In the distance could be heard the long-drawn snores of the dozing pig. At last the great moment arrived. A delicious odor was wafted upon the autumn breeze. Everywhere the barnyard citizens sniffed the air with delight. The red hen ambled in her pickety peckety way toward the source of all this excitement. Although she appeared to be perfectly calm, in reality she could only with difficulty restrain an impulse to dance and sing, for had she not done all the work on this wonderful bread? Small wonder that she was the most excited person in the barnyard. She did not know whether the bread would be fit to eat, but joy of joys, when the lovely brown loaves came out of the oven, they were done to perfection. Then, probably because she had acquired the habit, the red hen called, Who will eat the bread? All the animals in the barnyard were watching hungrily and smacking their lips in anticipation, and the pig said, I will. The cat said, I will. The rat said, I will. But the little red hen said, No, you won't. I will. And she did. Teddy Bear by A. A. Milne Read by Taylor Seth Hall A bear, however hard he tries, grows tubby without exercise. Our teddy bear is short and fat, which is not to be wondered at. He gets what exercise he can by falling off the ottoman, but generally seems to lack the energy to clamber back. Now tubbiness is just the thing which gets a fellow wandering, and Teddy worried lots about the fact that he was rather stout. He thought, if only I were thin, but how does anyone begin? He thought, it really isn't fair to grudge me exercise and air. For many weeks he pressed in vain his nose against the window pane, and envied those who walked about, reducing their unwanted stout None of the people he could see is quite, he said, as fat as me. Then, with a still more moving sigh, I mean, he said, as fat as I. <sighs> now Teddy, as was only right, slept in the ottoman at night, and with him crowded in as well more animals than I can tell, not only these but books and things, such as a kind relation brings, old tales of once upon a time, and history retold in rhyme. One night it happened that he took a peep at an old picture-book, wherein he came upon by chance the picture of a king of France, a stoutish man, and down below these words King Louis so-and-so, 
nicknamed the handsome, there he sat, and think of it, the man was fat. Our bear rejoiced like anything to read about this famous king, nicknamed the handsome, there he sat, and certainly the man was fat. Nicknamed the handsome, not a doubt, the man was definitely stout. Why then, a bear, for all his tub, might yet be named the handsome cub. Might yet be named, or did he mean that years ago he might have been? For now he felt a slight misgiving. Is Louis so-and-so still living? Fashions in beauty have a way of altering from day to day. Is handsome Louis with us yet? Unfortunately, I forget. Next morning, nose to window pane, the doubt occurred to him again. One question hammered in his head. Is he alive or is he dead? Thus, nose to pane, he pondered, but the lattice window, loosely shut, swung open with one startled, Oh! Our teddy disappeared below. There happened to be passing by a plump man with a twinkling eye who, seeing Teddy in the street, raised him politely to his feet, and murmured kindly in his ear, soft words of comfort and of cheer. Well, well, allow me, not at all. Tut, tut, a very nasty fall. Our Teddy answered not a word. It's doubtful if he even heard. Our bear could only look and look. The stout man in the picture book, that handsome king, could this be he, this man of adiposity? Impossible, he thought, but still, no harm in asking, yes I will. <clears throat> Are you, he said, by any chance, his majesty the king of France? The other answered, I am that, bowed stiffly and removed his hat, then said, excuse me, with an air. But is it Mr. Edward Bear? And Teddy, bending very low, replied politely, Even so. They stood beneath the window there, the king and Mr. Edward Bear, and handsome, if a trifle fat, talked carelessly of this and that, then said his majesty, Well, well, I must get on, and rang the bell. Your bear, I think, he smiled, Good day, and turned and went upon his way. A bear, however hard he tries, grows tubby without exercise. Our teddy bear is short and fat, which is not to be wondered at. But do you think it worries him to know that he is far from slim? No, just the other way about. He's proud of being short and stout. Next week on the Storytime Classics podcast... A story and a poem of the life of Johnny Appleseed. Remember that all episodes have companion ebooks available for free download in PDF and EPUB formats. You can find them on the Storytime Classics official webpage. The link is in the description. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram. If you are enjoying these stories, please share these recordings with your friends and consider donating to help keep this podcast alive. A link to support us is also in the description. This is Taylor Seth Hall, and I'll see you next week on the Storytime Classics podcast.